Welcome to Centropolis, a librarian's dream date with authors, characters, and ideas in the drama of a city on the edge of the plains and the center of the country. I'm your host, Crosby Kemper, director of the Kansas City Public Library. With us today is David Von Drehle, editor-at-large for the Time magazine based in the small frontier outpost of Mission Hills. He's the author of a number of books, notably Triangle, The Fire That Changed America, and Rise to Greatness, Abraham Lincoln and America's Most Perilous Year. David, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Uh, you've been a journalist for the Denver Post, the Miami Herald, the Washington Post, and you've been covering politics since 1992. That's a lot of Clintons. Yes, it certainly is. Let's talk about the differences and the similarities of 1992 and the 2016 uh, election. We've had we've got Clintons in both uh, elections, right. um, but Bill Clinton in 1992 is a very different character than Hillary Clinton. He, he's moving to the right; she's moving to the left. At least yes. the general election, she may be changing a little bit, but she's been moving to the left through through the convention anyway. Um, Talk a little bit about the New Democrats in 1992 and, right. and, and what Hillary and Bernie have been about in, in 2016. Well, in 1992, the Democratic Party was uh, in a shambles, sort of like you might say of the Republican Republics Party today. right now. Yeah. Uh, they had had one president elected in, I have to do my math quickly, but about 30 years. Uh, and that was Jimmy Carter in 1976. He was would only have happened in the Watergate. He was uh, sort of that. running the right of Jerry Ford. Exactly, for, for a kind little, of an accidental president yeah. almost. But otherwise, it had been not just Republicans, but landslide Republicans in 72, 84, 88, all big results. And along came Bill Clinton, who was uh, a Southern governor. Uh, from Arkansas, had been seen for years as a bright young comer in the party, but uh, very much the standard bearer of a new kind of Democrat. They called themselves New Democrats. They ran more against the old Democratic Party of uh, the left, of the Kennedys, especially Ted Kennedy, McGovern. That was almost a bigger project than running against the Republicans. And uh, so there was an excitement around that, a sense of something new. Uh, but it was also a zany, unpredictable, well, weird we, campaign. We had, we had the, the, the Donald Trump before Donald Trump. We had exactly. Ross Perot. Ross Perot, our first billionaire, uh, self funded, crazy talking. Yeah, he really uh, spent some of, his, some of his own money. Unlike, he spent a lot of his own uh, money, Donald. unlike uh, Trump. He, and, and, and my memory is he would buy half hour or hour TV segments and, and, and give long discursive. He bought one big long ad on the eve of the election. His big. Uh, uh, forum, uh, and this is kind of like Trump before Trump. Trump has mastered, uh, you know, Twitter and uh, Facebook and social media. Uh, it was Perot who mastered the 24-hour news uh, uh, phenomenon. He could get on the Larry King live show uh, at will. He'd call up Larry, go on the show, and do another segment. He was great TV. You didn't know what was going to come out of his mouth. And uh, But you can overdo the comparison to Trump as well. Perot was not uh, sophisticated on the issues, but he was educated on the issues, and he knew uh, what he thought well, and, and why and, he thought and they were, and, and, he, and he was taking positions on the issues that were discursive, that had, had some logic to them. You could disagree with him about NAFTA, though. Right. Though it is interesting that NAFTA is an issue again. It's uh, amazing trade to me. policy it, is, is, is one of the, the basic issues. Um, but, it, but there is a difference in the technology and also in the importance of the parties. I mean, Donald yes. Trump's campaign is basically 140 characters. It's the tweetocracy. Exactly. Uh, and and that's, those are characters, not words. So you, the actual number of words is pretty small. Mm -hmm. Sad, as he might say. <laughs> um, uh, so it, 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 does the, t the technology obviously makes, makes a difference. I mean, George Bush, the first President Bush, uh, wasn't that great on on TV. Bill Clinton's very warm on TV. Ross right. Perot had something to say. Right. It's uh, we're in a new age, and uh, Donald Trump is the avatar of that age. There's no question about it. And it's uh, what I called in 
Time Magazine, a disintermediated time. The uh, middleman uh, of politics has been cut out by Trump, whether it's the media or the parties or any of the go-betweens, the endorsers, all those that used to be uh, big factors uh, have been eliminated by Trump. He's gone directly to his audience, which he's built up over decades, uh, uh, promoting himself, his own brand, and he's a master of new media, whether it's social media, whether it's reality television. Uh, these are his milieu. He understands them much better than anyone else in politics right now. I'm not sure it's going to get him to the White House. It's going to get him much closer than we ever imagined. And somebody who's smoother and better but using those same techniques right. is going to come knows, along knows after something him. about the issues and, That's right. and, and, and the structure of politics once you're into a national campaign. Um, well, the, the, the disintermediation is interesting to me, and, and, and let's talk a little bit about that broadly. I, I sort of feel that, the, that we always have a virtual guest here, which is uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy <laughs> in America. Yeah. And in the 1840s, uh, 30s and 40s, when he wrote Democracy in America, he talked about America being a place uh, it, it, full of mediation the mediation of newspapers, associations, all kinds of associations, right. uh, religion, um, and, and, and all that sort of disappeared uh, today. And, and, and newspapers, of, of which you are a leading exponent, um, are not quite gone yet, but they're, the importance of the newspaper, the importance mm -hmm. of Time magazine, which everybody read when I was growing up, and right. I don't know how big the readership is today. It, talk, talk about that and the importance mm -hmm. of that in, in politics. Again, the difference between 1992 uh, and, and today. We were just seeing the glimmers of this change in 92. We were starting to talk about what the impact of this new techno technological digital age was going to be. Nobody had quite figured it out. It was, I think, for me, about four or five years later, the first time I went on Craigslist and saw that there were better uh, classified ads and they were free, uh, I said, uh-oh, this right. is trouble. Uh, but um, in a way that fascinates me, uh, what we're really experiencing right now is almost a return to the de Tocqueville age and, and, and the 70 years or so after that or the century after that when it was pretty inexpensive to start up your own newspaper. And just as it's pretty inexpensive to start up your own website or news site today compared to the monopoly era that right. you and I grew up in when there was maybe one or two newspapers in a town, a handful of television options. Now there's just an explosion right. and it's infinite. And just as that has uh, driven us into our niches, right. uh, broken up our big community into small communities right. of interest and of belief. Uh, the same sort of thing happened in the 19th century. There would be 30 or 40 newspapers going at any given time in New York City. Right. There was a newspaper targeted for every individual niche, and readers had to be more proactive. They had to be more educated to understand, okay, where is this news organization coming from? Right. How do I screen that? How do I correct for that as I sort in, of educate myself in, on what's going on. In, in Triangle, which is mm -hmm. about the Triangle Fire in 1911 and, and, and the consequences of that, but the, the importance of newspapers then was very great. Yes. But you're right, there were lots of news uh, niches, you know, the Pulitzer World uh, in the Hearst uh, paper and uh, you know you have the Jewish Daily Forward. You've got the uh, the, the socialist newspapers. You've right. got you got as you said something for every niche. On the other hand, the parties represented some things at the national level mm -hmm. uh, in which you could identify with. So you were identifying with certain policies and That's right. and, and, and whatnot. Uh, which and, and today the pol the party the party structure itself seems to have fallen. Uh, apart. Completely apart. Uh, we've seen that in this year. Uh, it's been happening for for decades, the decline of the parties, but never more obvious than this year and never more obvious than in the Republican Party. Uh, the uh, For a while we were talking about what Trump has done as a hostile takeover of the GOP. Uh, I've 
discovered an even better business metaphor, which is the what's called a reverse merger, where a kind of moribund public company is taken over by a private company as a way of circumventing the rules around going public. The GOP, this great party of Lincoln and of Roosevelt and of uh, Reagan, uh, really is not sure what it believes in right now. And in that vacuum, uh, this personality, Trump, has swept in and sees their nomination, even though he does not believe in anything that those three stood for, most importantly being conservatism, the idea of a conservative party. Nominating Donald Trump for president is a radical thing to do. It, it's it seems it's not be, conservative it, at yeah, all. Yeah, it seems to be based entirely on resentment. I mean, it's uh, what, what my old professor at Yale, Harold Bloom, uh, used to th say about the French critics and their uh, pigonies in, uh, in in America, the school of resentment. Right. And, 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 and Donald Trump is purely, it's insults. It's these two-word descriptions of uh, Marco Rubio or uh, or any of his opponents. Um, and isn't that a, isn't there a decline in in, in the the intelligence of, of politics and the? Well, who was it? One of the great politicians said you could uh, never. Uh, uh, fail by underestimating the uh, P.T. Barnum supposedly said exactly. Said that, yeah. and, uh, it was one set of another guy. He he always aimed just below the public taste, and he always he, hit he it. Hit it. <laughs> um, so there's some of that going on, and always has been. Uh, I think that. Uh, for me, as a representative of uh, an elite publication, you ask about our readership in ways it's bigger than it's ever been, uh, thanks to the Internet and its global reach. But uh, I caution myself get, uh, against getting too uh, smug about the Trump phenomenon, because I think at its heart there are uh, uh, resentments about uh, the failures of a sort of self-selected, self-appointed, self-perpetuating elite, uh, which has not uh, won the confidence of the American people in the way uh, they slash we have governed over the past generation, and people are tired of being talked down to. Uh, by us, and one of the things that I think really invigorates Trump's supporters is the idea that he is not afraid uh, to to give as as good as he gets from these sort of uh, w whether it's the politically correct police or the th Orwell might have called them the thought police, the people who decide what can be said, what can't be said, what can be discussed, what can't be discussed, what are the parameters of... Right. of uh, well, there, is, there is obviously some media... Uh Enjoyment of uh, Trump's speaking style, that, you know, when he uh, when he uh, started talking about the baby, uh, for instance, and you go back and you actually look at that, and he's just joking about the baby, and uh, uh, and, and there's a media storm about right. his, you know, attacking a baby. Right. Um, you know, that, that, that's kind of silly. On, on on the other hand, he's he's so loose with words that his Second Amendment uh, a, a talk or calling, saying Mexicans are sa sending us their rapists. I mean, those are legitimate concerns for all of us uh, that, that, he, that he can think in those terms, if, if we can call it thinking. Right. It's, um, I would not argue with anyone that uh, our, my profession, or not, it's not a profession, it's a craft at best, that my craft uh, distinguishes itself day to day in terms of seriousness. Uh, there's a lot of serious stuff going on, and whether uh, Trump wants a crying baby in his speech you know, or not really isn't the most important story in a given day. You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about your two uh, two great books, uh, The Triangle, which is about the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire uh, in 1911, which is the, for 90 years, was the worst uh, industrial accident. 146 people lost their lives. But you make the case here uh, about the importance of newspapers and in, in, in bringing attention to this. Uh, Herbert uh, uh, Byard Swope, uh, 
fascinating guy. Uh, it, it takes the district attorney down to the fire while it's going on, <laughs> right. and, it, and it only lasted a, uh, less than an hour, the mm -hmm. fire. Um, and uh, uh, so the newspapers played a role and the unions played a role. It's the right. growth of unions during this period of time uh, in, in New York and in the garment business is enormous. And it's also a story about immigrants and immigrant aid and immigrant support right. and the immigrants being brought into the Democratic Party right. in New York and changing Tammany Hall first and then maybe the Democratic Party mm -hmm. forever. Again, a very, very different story, but also a story about parties morphing and changing. The origin of this book for me was partly personal. I, I moved to New York City and discovered that uh, the fire had happened in the neighborhood I was living in, and so that intrigued me. But then on a professional level, I found myself covering politics and wanting to understand better how political change actually happens. And this, the Triangle Fire story, is such a tremendous story of how political change happened. The question uh, occurred to me as I began to study this horrible disaster uh, with uh, young people jumping from a uh, 10 story, nine story window uh, in the middle of the day in, in Manhattan, central Manhattan, with thousands of people watching. And the fire department there with the, with the, ladder, the ladder that, that wouldn't reach, reach the window. And and, and, you know, and the nets that won't hold anybody. And I, I would hear from people, well, it was so shocking and so horrible that, of course, things had to change. And what I realized as I began to research it was, no, people were dying on the job every day uh, by the hundreds in that early industrial age period. And so my question became, well, why did this disaster out of all the disasters lead to as much change as it did and that un and that opened up a story of political organizing of uh, demographic change of uh, the Democratic Party of New York at a, this critical time in its history and how that eventually and directly led to the New Deal well, a national transformation. It, it seems to you talk about that you know the factory owners give the Tammany Hall Democrats money right. which they liked a lot um, but there were votes, and it was sort of money versus votes, mm -hmm. and you had to get the people who organized the voters. And you tell great stories about Francis Perkins, uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous story, and, and a relationship with Al Smith, mm -hmm. and a relationship with the Tammany Hall guys. Right. And, and uh, uh, talk about that for us. Well, Al uh, Smith and his uh, friend uh, Robert Wagner, a, a little less remembered, but the author of uh, the Social Security Act and other important New Deal legislation, these were the two young stars of Tammany Hall in 1911 when this fire happened. Tammany Hall was still a classic boss-run uh, organization like the Pendergast machine here in Kansas City, uh, very strong central leadership, and uh, uh, Smith and Wagner, uh, a, an Irish uh, 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 kid from the Lower East Side and a German immigrant kid from Yorkville. These two were the coming stars of uh, Charlie Murphy's, uh, uh, Boss Murphy's party, and th they figured out that the old way of doing things, which was really based around Irish and German immigration in the middle of the 19th century, had to change yes, in the era Italians of Jewish and, Jews. and Italian yeah. immigration in yeah. the early 20th century, and that this fire was the issue that would speak to that I mean, new generation. And, and, and they both had great social consciences. At the same time, they did the, the bidding of Tammany Hall, so they got rid of uh, the uh, proto-civil service uh, okay. uh, things in, in New York so they could continue with their uh, pork barrel and, and patronage uh, positions. At the same time, they went for the 52-hour. Right, they children. were, they were, and, and this spoke to my feeling as I was watching how politics worked, even it, or didn't work in Washington, D.C., that 
ideological purity, that getting every issue right is not necessarily the road to progress, that sometimes you have to compromise, sometimes you have to hold your nose at uh, a small issue in order to get the bigger issue that you want. There, there are lots of forces in the world and lots of self-interest on, there are. On, on various sides. And you, know, you tell a similar story, a similar but with big differences in Rise to Greatness, your, your, your a great book about Abraham Lincoln in 1862, and it's essentially the lead up to the Emancipation Proclamation and the final declaration that slavery has to end, that the mm -hmm. war's really been about slavery. But you describe Lincoln as a gradualist, mm -hmm. as someone who's got to work for, with the border states, right. uh, very important. He's got to work with the, uh, the, the problem of the Europeans who want to, want to uh, recognize the Confederacy because of cotton, the importance of cotton in the world right. uh, economy. Uh, and his team of rivals, cabinet, et cetera. Um, and, but, but it's interesting that you also talk about there's this pull in Lincoln. He decides that uh, the divinity is, is shaping his ends. Mm -hmm. He quotes Hamlet. You quote him quoting Hamlet. Um, he becomes a very religious man, it seems, as, as the war progresses. Right. Uh, he, he's waiting for the will uh, of God to reveal itself, which essentially he's hopeful will lead him to uh, ending slavery. Right. Uh, is that, am I getting that right? Yeah, it's a fascinating story and one that's been uh, discussed by uh, Lincoln scholars and students of Lincoln since the day he died, which was, uh, you know, what did he really believe about religion, uh, and that clearly was a moving target through his life and, uh, and through the, the years of his presidency. But we do have uh, uh, this striking uh, moment in uh, the wake of the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862, the bloodiest single day in American history. Uh, a very narrow Union victory, uh, an imperfect Union victory, uh, but one that Lincoln took as a divine sign that he was to emancipate the slaves. And he said that to his cabinet. And they, some of them wrote it down in their diaries, and uh, all of them were shocked. And Lincoln knew they would be shocked. He said to them, you gentlemen are going to find this a little strange, what I'm about to say, but I've made a bargain with a covenant, a covenant with my uses God, you, uses him, the it, word covenant, covenant with uh, my with my Creator, that if He gave us a victory in this battle, I would free the slaves. The, the, the newspapers play a role here too. I, it, it, it's unclear. It's, I ha, I, I'll ask you directly because unclear from the the book. What, what you think the influence of the open letter that Horace Greeley. Uh, wrote, right. uh, and, and it, it, a moment in the summer, I think, of, uh, of 1862, right. when it's unclear what Lincoln is going to do. He's talked in July about, uh, uh, about an Emancipation Proclamation, but it's unclear. And Greeley writes this letter and says, come on, you've you got you to get going on this. Do you think that had an effect, or was, or was Lincoln use, using it as an excuse for something he already wanted to do? Lincoln, it's, he, it produces, the, Horace Greeley was uh, not the biggest newspaper man in, uh, in New York, but uh, in ways the most influential, highly mercurial figure who would go from despair to elation uh, at the drop of a hat about the progress of the war. And this uh, moment, August of 1862, was the low point for the Union in the entire war. And he chose this moment to uh, issue this prayer of the 50 millions, uh, attacking Lincoln. It had become fashionable to call him the biggest slave owner in, in, in America or slaveholder. Uh, and Lincoln seized on this, uh, I believe, uh, as an opportunity to reassure uh, his conservative uh, f factions 
in the North. And remember, the North was not all emancipationists. It was a coalition of people who supported slavery, of slave owners in the border states, all the way over to the Horace Greeley's and the Charles Sumner's and the great emancipationists. They were all being held together by this one man, Lincoln. And this was an opportunity to respond to Greeley. He knew he was going to free the slaves. He knew he was going to emancipate them. But he wanted to explain himself. And so he says to Greeley in what some people take as a very controversial or offensive statement, he said, I would save the Union right. if that means freeing all the slaves, I'll do that. If it means freeing none of the slaves, I'll do that. If it means freeing some and leaving others, which is what he was ultimately going to do with the Emancipation Proclamation, I'll do that. He knew what he was going to do, but he wanted to remind his his constituencies, why he was doing it, to preserve the Union, to save the Union, because that was the one thing all these disparate groups agreed on. So he focused on what people shared rather than what divided yeah. them. And, and in part, he was claiming it to be a military necessity, which James Gordon Bennett responds to, the other great right. editor of the of the time, saying, we hope this is not a dictatorial uh, at, at, uh, act that will lead to the ultimate uh, freeing of all the slaves, because Lincoln, of course, the Emancipation Proclamation only freed the slaves in the in the Confederate states, in the, the states that were, and places were in that were in rebellion. in rebellion. And he had offered the chance for people to keep their slaves. All they had to do was uh, come back into the Union. Uh, it, it, the the act has been criticized uh, for that reason ever since uh, Lincoln took it. Uh, but there were constitutional reasons for that. Remember, the Supreme Court was still controlled at that time by the same uh, majority that had written Dred Scott, and they were waiting for Lincoln to overstep his constitutional powers. So that was one limiting factor. Lincoln knew at the time that once that step was taken, there was no going back right. on slavery. So. Character matters. Yes. Lincoln's character, Francis Perkins' character. If you read these very good books, if you read David Von Drilly in Time, you'll admire his judgment and you'll be better able to make your own judgments about the interesting characters of our time and the perilous times themselves. Thanks, David. Thank you, Crosby.